He wanted the library to play an ongoing role in preparing young men and women for lives of public service. He visualized it as a vital center of education and exchange and thought. It will never be a dead place, merely housing relics and papers of the past. That would not be fitting for John Kennedy, who was so intensely involved in life. It will grow and change with the time. Forty years ago this month, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Museum was dedicated here in Boston. The library was built not only as a monument for the nation's 35th president, but as an ever-evolving institution to foster engagement in public service and the public good. And today we'll speak with the library's first two directors about how they worked to set the foundation of the institution and its current director about the vision for the library's next 40 years on this week's episode of JFK 35. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Well, welcome to this week's episode of JFK 35, a podcast by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. I'm Matt Porter. And I'm Jamie Richardson. On October 20th in 1979, the Kennedy family, President Jimmy Carter, and members and supporters of the Kennedy administration gathered together to celebrate the opening of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum in Boston. Let's go back in time to listen to some of the sound from that ceremony 40 years ago. This library will be more than just a collection of photographs and objects under glass. It will be a living memorial at many levels. Here in Boston, it'll take up the causes of the community, helping to revitalize this section of our city. Across the country, it will reach out to visitors and scholars, summoning young men and women to careers in public life. For those in other lands, it will be a beacon signaling the message of this nation, a lighthouse bearing witness to Jack's truth that America, at its best, can truly light the world. Like a great cathedral, this building was a long time coming, but it more than justifies the weight. Its grace and its dignity are, I hope and believe, worthy of the man whose memory it will nurture. Well, those two clips were from Senator Edward Kennedy and President Jimmy Carter, who spoke at the dedication. There was so much hope at the time that this library would not only become a place to honor President Kennedy, but provide a living, evolving center for his legacy. For example, today we're recording this podcast from the JFK Library to share the library's collection with the world. Jamie, how do you feel the library is doing in its mission to share and educate people about President John F. Kennedy? I mean, I think it's doing a great job. There's lots of outreach. We have so many uh, school children who come every year to learn about not only President Kennedy, the president, but also about civics and how what it means to vote, what civil rights is. There's also everything happening in the archives. A lot is digitized. A lot is being digitized. So people from around the globe can access it and all sorts of little fun facts can be found. I love looking through there. Um, We have lots of great forums programs for children. I think, the, I mean, the list goes on and on, basically. Right. And, and, you know, the last 20 years has really been a big game changer. You know, when this library was built, the internet wasn't um, something that people thought of. Uh, and now, of course, we have the ability to not only do this podcast, but um, share our collection online, digitally, just constantly trying to put more and more online for people. And I think what's really nice is people can come here, connect, get to know the library a bit but then also go home and, um, if they want, carry on a discussion that they started here in the building. Right. And I think President Kennedy himself was so curious and so about history and about how, what made things work and also really conscientious of how like his legacy would seem 50, 60, 100 years on. So I think having this place, Digital Archive, all the programming that you can watch either live in person or live at home, really, I think would probably impress him. And the thing is, the library's future wasn't always so clear as it is now. In fact, the story of how it came to be here on Dorchester's Columbia Point is one of the many stories people outside the building don't really know. 
Indeed, but luckily you and I got to meet the library's first two directors, Dan Fenn and Chuck Daly, and we got to hear what it was like building this library from the ground up. And I thought this would be pretty exciting. This would be fun. That's what the JFK Library's first director, Dan Fenn, said about taking the top job in the 1970s. And, and what a great opportunity to encourage and support people of every age to participate in politics and government in their communities or wherever the path led them. Fenn was a former member of the Kennedy administration. He remembers what Senator Edward Kennedy told him as he began building programs and organizing the archives for his late brother, President John F. Kennedy. When I started, Ted said to me, you know, what you do here in the next few years is going to determine what it's like for the next hundred. Chuck Daly was the library's second director, and he and Fenn are the sole surviving male members of President Kennedy's administration. Daly's proud of how the library has evolved over the years. Certainly uh, exceeded uh, the best hopes and expectations of uh, a great many persons, including myself. The library went through some twists and turns during its development. It had initially been proposed to be built in Cambridge, but residents were divided on the issue. Persons in Cambridge were for that. There were others who were fiercely against it because they thought that... uh, There'd be a lot of visitors going to Cambridge, and that sounds snobbish, but it's also what they felt. Instead, the library was built on a small strip of land overlooking Dorchester Bay on what is now known as Columbia Point. The undeveloped land next to the University of Massachusetts provided opportunity, but also uncertainty. Jacqueline Candy Anassis chose a young, unknown architect from Boston named I.M. Pei to design the building. Fenn remembers not everyone was excited about the design initially, including himself. I I was concerned about it, and they they said, well, we're meeting with the family in three weeks. We can't change it now, which was true. When I am people took the great covers, the sheets off the model, the whole family was there. I mean, babes in arms, you know. Everybody was there. And Jackie, who picked him as the architect, and and nobody said anything for literally a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. That's a long time. I am was very nervous. Finally, Side Shriver, wonderful guy, Side said, uh, "Well, I am. I'm sure it's very nice." But what's it got to do with John Kennedy? Well, it costs nothing. Uh, I mean, it's very interesting shapes put together in a very interesting, dramatic way. And I am, who was very articulate, was absolutely speechless. But um, they didn't, you know, nobody said, no, go back and try again. And and so it got built that way, and it is it is a dramatic building, and it is a dramatic site. The library's design, including its glass pavilion, would ultimately go on to become one of Boston's most iconic structures. I M Pei would then go on to be one of the most prolific architects of the 20th century, designing buildings across the world, including the Louvre's similarly iconic glass pyramid in Paris. Before the library was built. JFK's archive was located in a much more humble building west of Boston in Waltham. There, Fenn worked behind the scenes with his new staff to design engaging and inclusive programs for the library. So we had a lot going on in Waltham because that's the way we wanted people to see, see this institution. Fenn said interest in the library during its early years was stronger than anyone expected. Steve thought might be able to raise a million dollars. I think they raised about 10. The test mailings made money. I mean, it's just an outpouring of support right from the, right from the start. For both directors, they believe the library is well prepared to last another four decades and beyond. The staff, 40 years from now, 
is at least as strong. I don't think it could be stronger than the staff they have there now. I mean, the dedication of persons there, uh, their, their dedication is as strong as, uh, as it has ever been, and there are enough individual acts of courage on the staff and brilliance and dedication that uh, if that continues, I wouldn't worry about the next 40. So I had great confidence that in the people that were there, and I just think it's great. I'm, I'm very happy with, with the creativity and the imagination. And now we have a new director with new ideas, and I think the future is, is uh, very bright for the Kennedy Library. Dan and Chuck are right. The staff here is really amazing. I mean, we're part of the foundation. We work alongside the library staff. And the library itself has really been supported by an amazing staff over the past 40 years. Yes, it has. And it's had some amazing people like Dan and Chuck, among others, leading the way. And one of those people, Library Director Alan Price, is here with us right now to talk about the future of the library. Alan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And I think Jamie made a good point. It is your second time, so welcome to being welcome our first. Back. It's good to be back. So here we're talking about the 40th anniversary, and the main thing we want to start with is coming in as the new director, how do you feel sort of taking over the mantle of leading this uh, library, which has had a 40-year history now? It's an exciting opportunity. It's a tremendous cultural institution. It's a, it's a flagship institution within the Boston and national context. To be part of the National Archives and its special mission, it's just, it's an extraordinary moment. And when I think about the original vision of the library and what it was meant to do, the words laid out by Mrs. Kennedy are really the guideposts for the direction of the library, that it should not just be a memorial to a fallen president, though it, it, it does serve in part that way. But it should be uh, part of promoting the life and legacy and ideals of President Kennedy. And it should remain uh, vibrant in inspiring future generations who might answer the call to service that President Kennedy is very well known for in his act. Ask not uh, what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. It's trying to bring all that to life that makes it really exciting. And so for you, what is the most exciting part of the job going forward to try to continue to make this not just a memorial, but an evolving centerpiece of the community? I never tire of the people who travel thousands of miles to be here and share with us their personal stories of their memories of President Kennedy or Mrs. Kennedy or Bobby Kennedy and their connection to this place. We are not only repositories of documents and texts, but we are repositories of the stories and memories of the people who have direct experience with the Kennedy administration and their children and grandchildren. And I always ask them, how will you answer that call to service? And it's amazing how many people have lived their lives answering that call to service in their local communities or on a national stage. President Kennedy inspired and shaped and changed so many lives. In many ways, this is a gathering place for them to come back and give thanks. I love that thought of, of a gathering place of for people to come and think about President, President Kennedy's ideals. What are some of the other ways that you think going forward um, as a new director that we can make this into more of like a living legacy? I'm excited about the possibility of expanding our community partnerships uh, with the community in general, but also with other cultural institutions. I think the notion of any one cultural institution living out its mission in isolation is limited. And to the extent we can find other cultural institutions with compatible missions that we can align with, it ultimately expands the audiences who come here. It expands the, the reach of our message. It expands our impact uh, on the world. And so I'm always in conversations with other cultural institutions about uh, where is your strategic vision? What are you hoping to achieve? Are there ways that that intersects 
with our presidential library and museum and are there things we could do together to take our show on the road or get your audience in here. Uh, The other thing I would add is, and it shouldn't be surprising to me, but it always is, the number of people who live within five miles of this building who've never been here. And how can we simply go out and extend more of a welcoming message to our immediate neighbors? Because as much as I am grateful that people will travel from far and wide around the globe to be here, we have a responsibility to reach the neighborhoods immediately around us. Speaking of people who come here, it's about 200,000 people on average a year that visit this place. And that number really hasn't dropped um, since it opened. What do you think that says about the longevity of 40 years of that many people coming to visit here each year for the library? President Kennedy has an enduring and timeless message. His words resonate today much as they did uh, oh so many years ago. I think that people will always be hungry for presidential rhetoric that is ennobling, inspiring, and, uh, and challenges us to bring out the best in ourselves as Americans and citizens of the world. So with that hunger for that positive message, people come here and they are reminded uh, what is possible in this country and what is possible for them. So you mentioned the community, people being within five miles, not necessarily having come here. There is a you know, long history just to get to Columbia Point where we are today. And we we're supposed to be in Cambridge and Cambridge didn't want us. And now we, here we are in Dorchester. Can you speak a little bit about of the history of being in this area, in this part of Boston? Sure. As you know, when Columbia Point was identified as a potential site and Mrs. Kennedy came to see it and see the view from here and thought this was the perfect spot, It was a dump. There was nothing here. There was no development immediately around it. And so to see Columbia Point grow up all around this institution over the past 40 years, it's amazing. I remember coming uh, many years ago and visiting uh, when we had young children at the time. And it just wasn't nearly as developed as it is now. And I think Mrs. Kennedy's notion that this would be a catalyst for development in this area came true. And it's exciting to see where the point has come and where it's going with continued development. And we try to take advantage of that, of of helping to lead the point. We engage with the other businesses and institutions here to see if there is a way that we can develop it for everybody's advantage. And we certainly have a long-standing relationship with UMass Boston in terms of bringing their students over for internships and other things. Uh, It's exciting when a student from UMass Boston is working our admissions desk and they will, for, for the rest of their lives, have a tremendous memory of this place. And who knows, maybe it will inspire more people to become archivists. Yeah, we look out at the point here and you can see the entire city of Boston. You you see the harbor and it's beautiful. But of course, that comes with a bit of a problem, which is that it's a little hard to get out to the point. The nearest T is not the closest. What are some of the challenges, as you have talked about, wanting to bring in you know, the community that's just around us rather than just the determined tourist who, who makes sure to get here? Um, what do you think the challenges are um, laid out for us in the next five years, 10 years as we try to do that mission, which is to reach out to our neighbors, our direct neighbors? In some sense, it's all relative. Are we located in Cambridge or downtown Boston for that level of easy access? No. But at the same time, some of my colleagues are running presidential libraries in Abilene, Kansas. And that's a lot harder to get to. <laughs> so I think we're, we're a little bit off the beaten path, but we're not that inconvenient. And we're excited about the possibility of the state possibly redeveloping Fallon Pier and bringing water access straight to our library because there's already uh, a water ferry scheduled between Quincy and Boston, make it a lot easier for people to come not only on that uh, commuter route, but folks who come from the various uh, cruise ships could uh, have uh, excursion uh, boats right to our pier and come right in. And we do have the, the public access through the T and a shuttle bus, and I hope that uh, people will continue to take advantage of that. This past year, I believe about 25% of our visitors came by public transit. So I think that's really amazing that we, and you know, you point out Abilene, Kansas, and I think we 
think about, oh, we're kind of out of the way, but then you think about people who are really out of the way. So uh, Yes, and people go to great lengths to see the Eisenhower <laughs> Library. But talking about sort of the next, you know, not the next, I don't think any of us will be here in the next 40 years, but looking ahead as this institution continues to evolve, what do you hope to see in the next five to 10 years, hopefully, uh, as far as how this institution will continue to evolve from where it was when it started 40 years ago to now? When you think about the three pieces of our operation, one is the museum itself. And that is uh, exciting in the sense that we have historically shown such a small percentage of our total holdings. It is a challenge to us and we're excited by it to see if we can exhibit more to the public. And we hope to have a much more aggressive schedule around rotating the temporary exhibits each year. We're looking forward to this coming year doing in April an exhibit focusing on childhood in the White House. What is it like to grow up in the White House and different childhood perspectives on life in the White House. That'll be an extraordinary exhibit. All, all the dolls that were gifts of state to Caroline when she was a child in the White House will exhibit those. I think from a family perspective, it's a different way of looking at the White House. But the following year, we're going to do a whole perspective on the World War II aspect and expand from PT-109 and President Kennedy's history with the Navy. I think there's a, there's a role that we can play in commemorating uh, uh, military service more generally and really diving in deep on World War II. We can do a different theme each year. So that's excitement on the museum side. On the archive side, where we, uh, where we mostly service researchers and academics who come to really dive into the papers of the Kennedy administration and related co collections, we uh, continually work to declassify more and more documents and make more and more available. And we're very excited about a push that we'll be doing over the next decade to uh, more fully digitize the collection and make them available uh, for greater public access uh, through your own computer at home. And the third piece is we do a lot with public education, not only about the history of the Kennedy administration, but the, uh, the contemporary ideas that were based in that administration. So we did uh, a recent space summit where we not only looked at the history of the moon landing, but what's the future of space exploration. And uh, President Kennedy uh, championed so many issues uh, around the planet and around the arts and, and things. We will continue to champion those programs. So we attract phenomenal speakers to really important public conversations that we hope will educate and inspire future generations to be great citizens of the world. I think one thing that makes my job really easy and exciting, and I think a lot of other people's, is that President Kennedy had such a wide reach. You mentioned the arts, the environment, space, all these things. So I think it makes it always a very dynamic place, and it's always excited to be exciting to be here and see what's happening next. Yeah, I personally hope we can do more with the video footage that we have. For example, we showcase President Kennedy's masterful handling of the press briefings uh, that he did. That is the tip of the iceberg of those press briefing videos. I wish we could set up a, a booth where you could just sit and listen to them all because uh, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth on a president's ability to deal with the media and the press. President Kennedy was extraordinary at that. And I think there's a lot to be learned in how he did it. Well, Alan, thank you so much. I think there's a lot to be said here. And uh, we look forward to having you continue to be a repeat guest as the library continues to evolve. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks for welcoming me back. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our special 40th anniversary podcast special. Stay with us next time as we bring you more stories from the JFK Library. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at JFK Library using the hashtag JFK35. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review on iTunes. Thank you for listening and have a great week.